Good morning and uh, welcome, uh, welcome all to this uh, actually first inaugural um, Investor Meets Company presentation. Myself, Jason Ashton, Interim CEO, and Juliette Lowe's Interim CFO are delighted to be able to share um, more insight into the business over the next hour in a mix of presentation and Q&A. Firstly, we'll introduce ourselves, then we'll go through some of the key highlights in the shared presentation. So firstly, myself, Jason Ashton, I became the interim CEO in April of this year, having been the group CFO since April 2019. I'm a chartered accountant, having been in manufacturing organizations for nearly 25 years, mainly in FMCG companies with significant international exposure, as well as core financial experience complemented by previous experience in strategy, commercial and M&A roles. And I've certainly learned a lot in the last four and a half years in the building product sector. I'll then now like to pass on to Juliet, who will also give you a short introduction of herself. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I'm Juliet. Um, I'm currently interim CFO, um, but I've been with uh, Time In for the last five years, uh, previously as group financial controller. Um, so worked very closely with Jason and the rest of the leadership team in that time. Um, I've also managed to get around a lot of the operations, um, so I've gained a deep understanding of Timon um, in that time, um, and excited to be part of the leadership team now, um, helping drive forward the strategy. Um, prior to Timon, I spent my career with PwC um, in a variety of roles. Great, thanks, Juliet. So on to the main event, um, and firstly, moving to slide three, which just gives you very high-level key stats for those unfamiliar with, with the time and business. Firstly, we are market cap of around 600 million, and we're a member of the FTSE, both the FTSE 250 index and the FTSE for Good index. In 2022, we generated around 715 million pounds of revenue and just short of 95 million pounds of uh, adjusted operating profit. We employ around 3,700 people and sustainability, which I'll come on to later, is embedded in the business with 21% of revenues from products which, which have positive in-use impact as defined by the UN SDGs. Turning to slide four, this gives a good overview of, the, uh, of our offer. And as you can see, um, it is a full range of hardware and ceiling solutions for the doors and windows industry, together with a suite of solutions for roof, wall, and floor access in both commercial and residential buildings. Here you can see examples of what we offer, all of which are characterized by a range of high quality, innovative products, which are crucially supported by value added services. The first pie chart um, shows the, 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 the concentration of the portfolio. 70% is hardware, 20% for seals, uh, for doors and windows, and 10% is, um, is, is for access solutions. And then the second pie chart shows who we sell to. Two thirds is OEMs and 30% distributors and wholesalers. Turning to slide five, this shows our value proposition. The main takeaway from this chart is that our products comprise just 10 to 15% of the overall installed cost of our window and door. But as you can see here, they deliver significant value to the end user. We have included examples of here of what that value is to the end, end, end consumer within comfort, so offering ventilation and weatherproofing, sustainability, which again, I'll talk later on, particularly around the energy efficiency of buildings, security, safety, and aesthetics, all of which enables strong customer relationships and supports operating margins um, in, in the teams, which Juliet will cover later and again the point is here is that value um, that we uh, give to the end consumer um, and the fact that it is just 10 to 15 percent of the over installed cost means that price is less of an issue with our customers 
The next slide shows how we are grouped into our three geographical divisions to serve our customers, although we do have brands that span each of the divisions. As you can see, the North American division is the most significant, contributing two thirds of sales and operating profit in 2022, and above 70% on a pro forma basis following the acquisition of Lawrence, which again, I will talk about later. The international division is then our second biggest contribution, but spread over a few markets. And then the UK and I being the third, uh, uh, the third largest um, uh, division that we have. And really when comparing these three divisions, there is a similar split between residential and, co and commercial. And residential is by far the most important in all of our major markets. There is a similar split between RMI and new build, with all divisions having a greater dependence on RMI. There are some important differences, though, uh, through the divisions, such as make versus buy. The UK and I division is predominantly sourcing from China versus North America and international where manufacturing is, is done within the divisions. And within the route to market, the international sells mainly into distributors, given the fragmented markets, whilst North America and the UK and I division is mainly exposed to the OEM channel. And turning on to the investment case, as you can see here, as I, as I was talking about the value to the consumer, we have high barriers to entry. Our products generate significant value to the customers and end users relative to their cost. We have a large number of patents providing, providing a degree of IP protection with circa 500 active and, uh, and around 125 pending IPs. The examples include next generation casement window solution for the US market that incorporates magnetic elements in the handle to improve its operation. Innovative touch key keyless door security solutions for the UK market and microventilation solutions for sliding patio doors and sliding windows. Around 20% of sales are from those patent protected products, such as the core lock function on our market leading pinnacle balance in North America, patented easy spindle system for a range of aluminium handles in Europe, and the three star cylinder lock for the UK market that is the only one recommended by Neighbourhood Watch. Secondly, the value added services also help to create a strong barrier to entry. These include full integration into the supply chain for some of our major North American customers, where we ship just in time directly into their own production line, which takes out cost and complexity for the customer. Few others have the capability to do this. There is close collaboration with customers on NPD, such as applying our tilt and turn technology to our aluminium balcony doors. And thirdly, providing accredited testing services to the UK OEMs for their new products. And as a result of all this, we have long-standing relationships with many customers. An example here is we've been working with the largest North American customer since 1932, over 90 years ago, and that account is at least worth $70 million. We have a family of world-class brands, brands that are number one or two in their markets. Ainsbury Truth and Bilco are the number one brands in their respective segments in North America with around 40 to 45% market share. In the UK, ERA is a very strong number two brand with circa mid-teen share. 
all of these brands are very well known in their respective markets and certainly strong brand recognition amongst industry professionals. Turning to slide nine, we have clear mega trends which provide very favorable tailwinds supported by the value proposition I have just talked through. And more importantly, strong structural growth drivers in our major markets. Firstly, I'll talk about housing supply. The last 15 to 20 years, housing supply has failed to keep pace with demand. And I'll talk specifically to North America shortly, but it is also very true in both the international and UK markets. Eradication of structural deficit will support new build growth for many years. Secondly, there is an aging housing stock. The housing stock generally getting older due to the underbuild of new housing. And again, I will talk to the U US trends shortly. And this will support replacement market for our hardware and seals in the coming years. And thirdly, on remodeling spend and the, and, um, and, and the different patterns of remodeling spend, particularly what's happened since the, um, the pandemic. The increase in work from home means consumers have wanted to improve what is now not just a living environment, but also more often a working environment. This in turn has generated demand for replacement windows to increase natural light, for example. And it's very true, and I'm sure for everybody on this call, people spend more time in their home, and that has changed the relationship somewhat and propensity to want to improve people's surroundings. And of course, there is an increasing drive to improve energy efficiency of building, which is another tailwind for our RMI markets. As we are ever increasing um, in government regulations. For example, safety, um, particularly after the, um, the, the, the Grenfell experience, energy efficiency, and in uh, and our biggest market in Italy, uh, the, there's been over the last few years, government grants um, to support um, RMI activity, which has a green benefit. And of course, climate protection, with an upgrade, for example, upgrades to hurricane resistant with, uh, windows in, uh, US, the, in the US Hurricane Alley. As I said, I will talk more about the North America where after the Lawrence acquisition, we, um, our revenue is, is around 70% um, exposed to North America. And the structural growth drivers are very, very favorable in, um, in the largest and attractive market of North America, where we have our market leading share of between 40 to 45% in the product categories we participate in. Our other competitors, although strong in individual segments, do not offer the broad range of products that we do, which further reduces complexity for our customers. On the chart on the left-hand side, you can see the US housing starts since 1980. Since the global financial crisis, the starts, as you can see, have been below the 1.5 million level, which is required to support the population growth. And this has created a massive housing deficit since 2008. The deficit is particularly acute in the single family housing, which is more important to us. And single family homes have more operational windows and doors that require more hardware compared to multifamily housing. And on the right hand side, you can see the, uh, the chart of the percentage of housing that is 20, 20 years or older and 40 years or, or older since 1995. And there has been a clear step up since 2025, 2020, sorry, 2005 and post the GFC. And within that, 
the median age of US housing has risen from 30 years in 2005 to around 40 years in 2021. And the sweet spot for window replacements is 17 to 20 to 20 years. So following the decline in new build since GFC, now there is a larger percent of homes reaching that sweet spot that need the replacement of windows and doors. And again, creates a uh, favorable um, uh, tailwind for our business. Turning to slide 11, sustainability is an integral part of our strategy. And as mentioned previously, there is a much greater awareness of energy efficiency and sustainability and is therefore a very important growth trend for us. Today, around 20% of sales from our portfolio have a positive impact on one or more of the United Nations SDGs. And around half of these relate to energy efficiency products, such as seals that reduce thermal loss or microventilation products. Safety and security products have also proven to reduce crime, such as high security locks, or improve protection against climate hazards, hurricane resistant roof hatches, or fire related riser doors and seals. And these are also key contributors to our positive impact on our product portfolio. Slide 12, I'm now gonna hand over to Juliet to talk about the operating margins. Thanks, Jason. So slide 12 really highlights that Timon has delivered consistently strong operating margins in mid to high teens, which in large part is due to that high value to cost ratio of our products. So we show here the operating margin progression over the last five years for each of the three divisions. You'll see that North America generates a few percentage points higher than the other two divisions. And that's really due to that greater scale, the high market share, uh, benefits of serving a more homogenous market and because it predominantly manufactures its own products. There's significant opportunity to expand these margins further. We've set medium term margin targets being 20% for North America and 15% for the other two divisions. We believe these targets are achievable and each division at certain points in the past have managed to achieve these. What we do need though um, is a more normalized demand and inflation environment than what we've seen over the last few years. Um, clearly, given its size, North America hitting this target will have the greatest impact on value creation. So just to give a bit more color here, um, the division suffered uh, quite significant margin dilution of around 250 basis points across 2021 and 2022. Um, due to the lag in recovering that significant cost inflation uh, post-pandemic, as well as the effect of just passing through the costs. So the underlying margin is really closer to 17%. In the first half of this year, we have begun to see this reversing and we've got further initiatives in progress that give us confidence in getting to the 20% target. So slide 13 shows that timing is highly cash generative benefiting from those high margins, as well as low maintenance capex, which typically is around one to 2% of sales. We target operating cash conversion of above 90% through the cycle. And the chart here shows that we've delivered this over the last five years, achieving an average of 97%. 2019 and 2020, you'll see are a bit higher as they benefited from a significant working capital unwind with the reverse occurring in 2021 and 2022 as we built inventory to protect against that significant industry-wide supply chain disruption. We've managed to largely unwind this in the first half of 2023 um, and achieved 100% cash conversion. This gives us a strong balance sheet with significant headroom on our debt covenants, available liquidity of around 183 million and leverage of 1.2 at the end of June this year. Slide 14 sets out our approach to capital allocation, which seeks to balance investing to drive growth with shareholder returns and balance sheet efficiency. That investment for growth is both organic to support our strategic initiatives, um, including new product development and channel expansion, 
and through targeted m a and we target a return on capital employed of 14 percent our dividend policy is progressive with a target cover range of two to two and a half times and to maintain balance sheet efficiency we have a leverage target range of one to one and a half times adjusted EBITDA Thanks, Julia. Um, I'll now spend a few minutes talking about um, our, our strategy for long-term uh, growth. We have a clear strategy for growth and margin progression. And as you can see here, it is underpinned by our values and with sustainability very much at its core. The three key elements of the strategy are focus, define and grow which I'll explain in a little bit more detail on the next slide. So firstly, focus, which is really about optimizing the platform and driving margin expansion. And there's a couple of examples here. Are we rationalizing, streamlining, streamlining the footprint, manufacturing and distribution, but also harmonizing our product portfolio? And at the same time, fine-tuning fine systems and processes and driving continuous improvement and lean. Sustainability angle is really about improving the safety and environmental performance of our own operations and supply chain. Secondly, uh, we, we, we have a defined block, which is really about creating cultural cohesion and developing best practice and value adding collaboration op opportunities between the three divisions and our small head office here in London. And again, sustainability plays a key, a key role here in ensuring time and as an employer that people want to work for. And then thirdly, our growth strategy is about both organic and in inorganic growth opportunities. Organic is around new product development, improved and superior customer service and market expansion. When we talk about inorganic, and I'll talk about um, the Lawrence acquisition um, shortly, but we do feel Timon is the natural consolidator in, the fra in a fragmented marketplace. And again, sustainability, and we talked about the UN SDGs, but products with positive sustainability give us real competitive advantage in the marketplace. And now Juliet will just touch on the recent trading announcement. Okay, so just to give a quick overview of our most recent results, uh, which were for the six months ended 30th of June, 2023. So overall trading in the first half was solid against a very strong comparative and despite a very challenging market backdrop. Like for like revenue declined 11%, reflecting a significant reduction in volumes that we began to see in the fourth quarter of 2022, both due to un underlying demand softness and customer destocking, which more than offset the carry forward benefit from pricing actions that we implemented last year. Like for like adjusted operating profit was 24% lower as the benefit of pricing some easing in input cost inflation, and our agility in flexing the cost base wasn't enough to offset the impact from the significant reduction in volumes. But in our largest division, North America, it was pleasing to see the reversal of that pricing lag, along with good cost management, having an increase in the division's operating profit margin to 15%, despite a significant reduction in volumes. Cash conversion, as, as I mentioned, was very strong uh, due to the inventory reduction initiatives, and we were pleased to complete the acquisition of Lawrence Industries in July, which Jason will come on to talk about. And lastly, we raised guidance for full year adjusted operating profit, which mainly reflected the impact of Lawrence, uh, but also the better than expected first half outturn. And just to note here that we did not assume any improvement in market conditions in the second half. In that. Thanks, Juliet. As I said, our growth strategy is both um, organic and inorganic. Um, and as you, um, anybody knows time and the last acquisition we, um, we transacted was, uh, was in 2018. 
Um, so we were delighted uh, on, 20, uh, on the 12th of July this year um, to announce that we had um, acquired the Lawrence industry business in North America. Uh, and I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about that acquisition. So we paid uh, initial $57 million to acquire the business with further consideration of up to $12.5 million payable if uh, stretching EBITDA targets are hit over the next 18 months. Lawrence, Lawrence Industries is a highly profitable business with around $7.5 million profit before tax on around 20 million of sales. It manufactures and sells high performance composite window hardware for the North American market with very low price points, typically less than 10% of the overall installed window cost. It is a highly efficient and agile manufacturing operation, which offers superior service levels, as well as quick changes to customer specifications. And it is highly complementary to the Amesbury Truth product portfolio. It's a low cost composite product category, which is a beneficiary of the growing demand for affordable housing in the US. And it is immediately earnings enhancing uh, with around four to 5% contribution on a full year basis. It takes us slightly above our target leverage range, but as Juliet said, with the unwind of working capital in the second half, we do expect to be in the middle of the target range by the year end. And the current Lawrence leadership team is staying and excited at the opportunities to grow as part of an Elange group. So finally, um, in summary to conclude, Timon has a very solid platform with leading brands in niche fragmented markets with, a deep, with deep customer relationships and domain expertise and offers a compelling investment case with both structural growth and margin expansion opportunities. So bringing that all together, we see a long runway of earnings growth potential for Timon. And our strategy has sustainability at its core and will deliver long-term growth. And with that, I will pass back to Alessandro um, and I think we will then go into uh, Q&A. Jason, Juliet, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab, which is situated on the top right -hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Matt, at this point, if I could just hand over to you to run through the Q&A, that'd be great, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Okay, thank you, uh, Alessandro. So uh, thanks to those of you who have uh, submitted questions. Um, first one is from Sam. Um, and it relates to the Lawrence acquisition. Um, so he just asks how the integration of that is progressing so far. Um, and then secondly, um, what is uh, the view on future MA? Okay, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, great question. Um, so, uh, you know, we, um, we transacted on the 12th of um, July, so we haven't had the business um, for too long. And I think, I think it's fair to say, um, this is a light in integration with the um, efficiency um, and agile manufacturing operation. Um, th there are some procurement synergies, but from a manufacturing point of view, um, there are less so. And to be quite frank, um, given the, um, the given that, that efficient operation, um, we are we are obviously tended to leave that to um, you know to, to the local management team. Where we see the um, the real benefits of the acquisition are on the um, on the commercial integration, particularly taking the Lawrence products to um, some of the tier one or the bigger customers um, that they're not participating currently, um, and also um, with our geographical reach, particularly in areas where it is a family company. So you know you, you can imagine that to be more cautious on investment in terms of um, Salesforce. So the uh, the Western US 
um, is a real um, area of opportunity uh, for us because Lawrence are not particularly present there, um, as as is Canada as well. Uh, and we're starting to um, you know to visit customers in those areas, um, and um, the feedback so far is is very positive about the uh, about the products. Um, and also, as we transition from um, their independent sales reps to ours, and as you can imagine, uh, the capabilities um, are, um, I, I'd say we have greater capabilities in the Ainsbury Truth Network, as well as that geographical coverage, um, that, that is going according to plan. In terms of, um, you know, future m and I, I would say Lawrence is a, has been a bit of a sweet spot in terms of um, M&A, in terms of, it is a bolt-on. Um, it was a family company, so it was a bilateral process and very much the family wanted to, um, you know, uh, as the founder was nearing retirement, they wanted a good home for their legacy um, and, and they felt Amesbury Truth really delivered on that. Um, and, you know, both, but both the family and um, our organisation are delighted to welcome welcome them in. There are probably less assets now, given our market share, um, that we can do, um, uh, which is similar to uh, to Lawrence. So um, you know, uh, acquisitions are more likely to be um, um, more adjacencies uh, in in North America. But we're there for, but we do have opportunities for more, you know, for bolt-ons in um, in the in the UK and international. Um, but given the, um, you know, the, the structural um, uh, favourable tailwinds in the US and our position there, in the next twelve months, the um, the focus will be more on on North America in terms of M and A. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, we've got another question here from David. Um, this is around um, what opportunities are there for new territories, um, or are you happy with the growth opportunities um, we have in the existing footprint? Yeah, thank you, David. Um, another great question. Um, I, I, I talked about a couple of areas there in, in terms of North America where um, we have, when we talk about market expansion and channel expansion, um, we have laid down distribution facilities in, in the Western US over the last um, uh, 12 months, an area where we were um, uh, less penetrated and in areas in, in Canada um, also where we've, um, we've also um, increased our presence. Um, so we're not envisaging any new markets um, at the moment it, it really is taking our products into um, um, into territories um, in the markets that we're we're present um, both you know territories as western us as i mentioned or into um, in, into different channels for instance in the uk um, you know you could think of e-commerce for example great thank you jason um at this stage, there doesn't appear to be any other questions. Um, Alessandro, am I? Yeah, Jason, yeah. Juliet, Matt, thank you very much for addressing those questions from investors. And of course, the company will review all those questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Me company platform. But just before redirecting investors, provide you with their feedback, which is particularly important to the company. Jason, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, sure. So. Um, I, I thank you all for uh, joining us this morning. As I say, this is a um, this is the first inaugural um, uh, use of um, Investor Me Company presentation. So um, uh, we're very very interested in um, in, in feedback on uh, on the experience of uh, everybody on this call. And um, if there are any further um, questions, we would be delighted to um, to give you more insight in, insight on the um, on the on the time time and business. But um, Thank you all again for um, joining the call and your attention. And um, hopefully we've given you a, a good flavour of um, the investment opportunity here at Timon. Jason, Juliet, Matt, thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, which I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company.
on behalf of the management team of Time and PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good morning to you all.